Welcome to the Journeys Podcast. My name is Alexander Faubel and each week I bring you an inspiring person or story that can help you uncover your own true potential. We deal with the question of what influence psychedelics play on the path to self-actualization and inner healing. We share experiences and present both traditional and modern mental health tools that can support you on your path to living the life your heart truly desires. Great to have you here with me today and now let the journey begin. This podcast covers topics that can touch on the subject of drugs. This format is purely educational and is not an invitation to use drugs. Furthermore, the use and or trading of drugs is punishable by law. This podcast is not suitable for persons under the age of 18. Be responsible, be safe and do your own research. So in the last episode, I had a chat with Noah on his work as an underground psychedelic therapist in the US. And this week, you'll hear the continuation of my recording with him, where we go over the details of the process of one of his retreats. Some of the questions that were interesting to me were, what is the agenda for such a weekend? What psychedelic substances are used and why? In what order and what dosage do people experience the medicine? And what happens if there is an escalation of some sort, when there are up to 16 people in the room and all are under the influence of some kind of psychoactive substance? So Noah shares with me how he distinguishes between two major parts of the process of the medicinal experience. The first part, which is all about storytelling and awareness. Basically, just feeling, mainly being in the somatic, empathogenic and psychedelic experience itself. And then the second part of the process, where they shift into more of a psilocybin medicinal use case, which oftentimes tends to be more introspective and quiet as the evening comes to an end. So unlike traditional therapy work in a 101 or 102 setting, there are other dynamic factors that have a significant impact on how his group sessions unfold. According to Noah, there is an intelligence of the relational field of the community that decides what happens and how the evening unfolds. So the overall process is strongly characterized by collaboration and mutual co-creation of the experience, which I found really interesting. I learned that an essentially important part of his work is the integration process at the end of the retreat, which he calls storytelling. Each participant has the opportunity to share their own individual experience and in turn have it mirrored as part of the group experience in the overall context. It is through this linking of shared, deeply felt experiences that the strong sense of community and connection results, which in retrospect leads most participants to develop deep friendships and relationships that last for years beyond the retreat setting. The difference between this and traditional therapy models is that here the safe space of the community itself is the primary healing modality. The comfort and exploration of relationships in a group setting and the reciprocal cycle of giving and receiving healing is the main part of the relational therapy process, so to speak. What became clear to me again was what he said, the quality of the relational feelings you carry within yourself, how you relate to yourself and to others, whatever that feeling is, will unfold and manifest in your life. So there are so many lessons that, as you know, we can take from this kind of work and apply it to our own daily lives. But understanding what kind of impact this work can have in a cross-generational context just blew my mind and gave me a lot of new perspectives on this field of work. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode as much as I did and I'm looking forward to having you back here next week. And until then, like always, just remember to be yourself. Good to have you back, Noah. It's been a while. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Good to talk to you again, Alex. So like I mentioned before in our last recording, I think it would make sense for other people that are potentially interested in that kind of work in a more detailed level to get a little bit more of understanding on how such, let's say, a weekend ceremonial retreat that you're setting up with your partner might look like. What would they have to expect from such a, from such a retreat from Know, set and setting like they show up as a maybe a, a smaller group like say three four five people and then they meet up with other group uh, groups that they maybe have not met before and then maybe they have but they just show up there and then you just greet them i mean from from the basis where does it you know happen is it outdoors indoors what happens 
what's psychedelic do you offer them is it right right away it's like the welcome drink and there you go with mdma like wh how how does it work and what's this <laughs> what's the setup Maybe. yeah yeah sure so we practice this work in a variety of locations sometimes it's in uh, a host's house mm -hmm. uh, we also have a uh, we have access to a piece of property uh in the mountains about two hours outside of the city a beautiful natural setting and with a house on it uh, that's very very nice for this work that we, we we prefer to do it in that kind of context in nature mm -hmm. it can look different ways but typically um the way it works let's say it's a we often do in a format of three days two nights um which tends to work for a lot of people mm -hmm. so the, the first the first day um people arrive and it's kind of like the experience itself is kind of like a almost like a group sleepover kind of thing. Like the, the house or the space is sort of transformed. Usually we would transform a section of it into like the central sort of ceremonial space. People set up bedding and stuff all around the, the property or whatever. Um, so the, the whole space sort of becomes like sort of a, a family sleepover party kind of feeling, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, which can be quite fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then when people arrive, you know, Our, our work, uh, unless we're starting a, a new group or uh, the typically um, uh, probably 50 to 60 percent of the people in any given group will have been there multiple times before. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a sense of continuity, even as people come into and then leave the work when, they, when it no longer serves them. Um, there's a sense of core group continuity that underlies, which is very important and creates mm -hmm. sort of a culture and a sense of safety. Um, when people come in if it's their first time i will have talked to them or my partner will have talked to them at length on the phone beforehand we'll have established relations with them report already so they won't be coming in totally blind mm -hmm. and usually it's by referral so everybody who comes in will have known somebody else mm -hmm. uh, who was involved in the work at some point um come in you know we we begin each day with a with an opening circle um, which is typically It, depending on what's going on and you know what we're feeling, I may share some specific thematic things, share some poetry, show part of the film, talk, or it may go right into sort of a more open-ended storytelling and sharing circle. But typically it's nice. I, I give the option for everyone to share a little bit of themselves, how they've been, where they're coming from. Um, talk around any intentions they may have, although it's not necessary, I think, to, to come with a specific intention beyond just being and experiencing what the experience is. So that part of it uh, is sort of the opening, and it really helps establish uh, a sense of connection and continuity and community, mm -hmm. uh, which is really important. Then after that, we transition into the experience with the medicine itself. Typically the way we work is a titrated experience. So it's not like we get everything at once. Usually there's like a first, second, third, and occasionally a fourth mm -hmm. round of, of medicines that slowly build or modulate the experience over time. Very often when people first come into the work, assuming it's not medically contraindicated, we begin an empathogen like MDMA to help support opening and relaxing into the space and just connecting. And we will modulate the intensity of that and potentially add in other things as the night goes on with each person individually. So that's really important that each person has a direct sort of line of communication with me about what they're taking, how it is. And we can, I always feel it's better, particularly in the beginning, not necessarily later on, but particularly when someone's beginning to help them feel a sense of safety over a slow build up into the mm -hmm. experience that they can understand their own reaction and body and not be overwhelmed by anything. Mm -hmm. So this kind of process, the, the experience with the medicine itself, I kind of think of it in two ways. You know, the first part, which is very sort of language and sharing is really about sort of storytelling our stories, connecting the experience with medicine is, is very much about like awareness, just feeling being being in in the somatic and pathogenic or psychedelic experience together and with others and that can look many different ways typically our groups are uh, begin in a more social way so people will be talking and sharing and very often there's just there is an intelligence of relationship intelligence of the relational field of community that shapes what happens so very often somebody who is there and dealing with a particular issue in their life 
will very often spontaneously find themselves connecting with somebody who is also dealing with that issue or is dealing with that issue from the other side. And the way this can be explored is not just sort of intellectually, but through energetically taking on different roles. It's a little bit hard to describe. You just have to experience yes. it. But the, the process itself is, is co-creative and collaborative. So what the ritual looks like, what the process looks like is really just defined by who is there and what they create together. Wow. Typically later in the evening, we shift into more, for those for whom it's appropriate, we'll shift into a more psilocybin-based medicine, which is more psychedelic, of course. Oftentimes that can lead into a more introspective, inward, quiet, part of the experience, although for some people, they, they may choose to stay in a relational social space. So it's, we really try to create within the environment spaces for people to navigate to whatever kind of experience is most supportive, wow. whether it's connective or solo, you know? And so the idea is that everything is available and that we're working with people to help kind of allow their own intelligence to guide the process. And then... <sighs> So that experience happens. People have dinner at the end of the night, you know, so, okay. go to no, sleep. No. When, when, when does that happen from a time, time perspective? When they get there, and because you said you're opening up with the, the opening circle and everything, and this takes a little while. And then because you mentioned in the evening, you do start potentially with psilocybin. And I'm just imagining how long are people working? With oh, okay. Them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends. But like sort of a typical schedule will be day one. We start with the opening circle at four. People will ingest the medicine usually by 5, 5.30, um, and they will be in that experience, which is titrated and modulated throughout the evening until probably, I don't know, as late as midnight or one, mm -hmm. um, at which time there, we always prepare soup and other sort of dinner items for them. There's a natural process of communal coming together, eating, sharing about the experience, go to sleep. If it's a two-day event, that same sequence starts again the second day. And then on the third day, we have a longer circle of story making, storytelling, and integration, where people are really sharing about their experiences and narrating the weekend to each other and with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to me, you know, is, is the notion that we're all sharing an individual experience that we've had personally, but our individual experience is part of everybody else's experience. And so as we talk about what happens for us, we're also reflecting or re revisioning what happened for other people so it's like we all see the same thing we experience together from many different angles and many different sides so powerful uh, and mm -hmm. i yeah and that that, that part is really powerful and, and sort of the weaving of a, a deeply felt experience into the threads of community and the threads of connection which then most people uh, i'm not going to say it always happens but but I would say the majority of people who attend these kind of circles more than once develop significant relationships or friendships in the circles that then endure for many years. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine. And if you say just from the structure side of things, again, because you said if it's a three-day event, the second day will just repeat more or less the first, first one. And then imagine people having had the opening circle, then starting kind of on different doses on, on MDMA, let's say, would you decide with them together on the dosage or is it them if they have had experiences before, I know I'm going to go for 120 this time or how does that look like? And then going into potentially psilocybin, would they just come, always come to you or your partner and then ask for permission to start something new? Will everyone be open to, to that side of the experience or would would you always regulate and modulate everything and if you say no i don't feel like it it doesn't work maybe next time they would just have to abide by those rules basically sure i mean so when somebody is inexperienced with this kind of work at all or inexperienced just working with us you know it, it really just depends on the person and their experience level if somebody's completely inexperienced then obviously they're not going to know what's what And so we're going to really sort of decide for them as people gain experience, either in, in this work in general or with us in particular, then it becomes more of a collaborative dialogue. I mean, it's always important when you're working for somebody with, with somebody, with people to have a sense of safety, you know, and that's in trust and the safety and trust flows both ways. 
So you as a practitioner have to feel safe and trusting of the person that you're working with. And that's a process that happens gradually over time. Or it can happen right away if you just have a really strong resonance sense with them. And they have to feel safe and trusting with you. And the depth of the work and its potential, I think a lot of times initially when somebody is less experienced than the facilitator participant dyadic relationship is more intense. That sense of safety and trust between the two is very important. As things progress, people become more autonomous, more trusting of the group, more knowledgeable. And then that sort of diffuses more into the collective experience as a whole that everybody is creating. And at that point, you know, you, yeah, people, people express preferences about what they would like to do tonight, what they would like to work with, which medicines or in which combination they would like. And, you know, as long as it's reasonable and within <laughs> my own comfort level, I'll, of course, I'll, of course, um, support that because it's, mm-hmm. it's your journey and your intelligence, not mine. Yeah. It's really guiding the process, you know. And are you and your partner, are you guys staying sober the whole time? Are you taking a little bit of medicine as well? Um, more often than not, uh, we will not take something or if, if one of us is going to microdose, sometimes I'll microdose taking maybe no more than a third or even a quarter of the amount that you would give a participant can be very helpful depending on the context. Sometimes participants actually prefer that. If we're going to do that, only one of us would do that. So sometimes on occasion, if one of us choose to take a microdose as part of the process, we would alternate who would take it. So there's always somebody who's not taking anything. Mm -hmm. Um, Earlier in my practice, I found it more helpful to take microdoses as I was working. Uh, As I've gone along, I've found it less and less necessary. So I do it much less now. Mm -hmm. If, if I imagine it's you and your partner, do we have other facilitators there on site that help out with support us? Just you two? Typically, it will just be us, although sometimes people are in our community or in our group who are also facilitators or mm-hmm. have another depth of experience. But usually, usually at, at the size up to 15, 16, we're comfortable just with the two of us uh, as the facilitating sort of dyad. Um, but sometimes... In certain contexts, yeah, it's been helpful to have other people with experience um, guiding also there uh, yeah. and supporting. Well, well, that's interesting because that's different to what most people potentially are used to when it comes to more of an individual you know, approach to that kind of work. Having a one-on-one setting or even uh, two facilitators and one participant when it comes to potentially an official FDA-approved MDMA a map setting, for sure. right? And then you have, for sure. In your case, you have two facilitators, the two of you, and the rest of the group. But just learning through our last conversation and today, I, I I expect that a lot of the therapeutic, quote unquote, work that happens happens off discussions with you two. It's the people within the family or outside of them connect with each other, like you said, that healing and or the intelligence of the relationship, the healing intelligence just forms it way itself and then just the, the people yes. since they become used to this and, and learn more and more through the process just know more and more about how to approach this and need less of your attention and focus this is what i i would assume is that the case yes because the 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 community container itself the process of ritual with others is like the primary healing modality here um, and so it's like those the the comfort and exploration of relationships and situations within that group is is like sort of the the main um, part of the relational therapeutic uh, process, but it really depends. You know, some people come and they need a lot of direct one-on-one attention, and some people don't, or some people sometimes don't need any attention directly, and other times they need like a lot of mm-hmm. more direct therapeutic one-on-one kind of attention. And so, you know, we do our best to just adapt and to provide that uh, when it's necessary and appropriate and to take time with individuals when they need it. And like part of the maturation of a group container is also sort of like a, an energetic balance where different people in the group will s- spend time with people who need more support at some times mm-hmm. so that we're able to support other people and vice versa. Because 
when you're working with groups, you know, I think what people often find is it's very important to both give and receive that both are part of like yeah. a, a cycle. And so it's like a cycle of reciprocity, you know, so people need the opportunity to support other people. Like that's very important for, for healing as well as receiving support. Sometimes people are more skewed toward one side of that or the other. Like they're, they're more capable of receiving than giving, or they're more capable of giving than receiving. Uh, and so like a big part of the, of healing together is creating a space and where it's possible for people to do both hmm. and to participate in both sometimes in, in the same, the same evening, you know? And so, so that's just part of like the, the life cycle and the, the flow and the energetics of the, of the room. I mean, we also do do like individual private work when people need like really want a lot of specific one-on-one -on -one therapeutic attention. So that's also an option, of course. Yeah, like I imagine, okay, you have a collective setting and then it's maybe 7, 8 p.m., right? People have had the opening happened and then they've taken, well, most of them, or if all of them have taken some MDMA. They're so open and the empathy just floods out of them. Every cell just talks, you know, empathy and, and uh, connection. And there's such a beautiful experience of openness and trust and loving in the air. And then all of this is happening. And then one person who's had a really hard time in their past, let's say a traumatic experience might be triggered and comes up through that process because you know they might have taken a little bit more of MDMA than before and they've never done that. And then they just feel like, oh man, uh, this is not going well. I need, I need more attention. Someone like that would then mm -hmm. be able to reach out to you or your partner and then say, could we go to another room? I would just rather be by myself. Oh, of course. We would you and then, okay. Oh, then, okay. oh of course, yes. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's really key. You know, it's like sort of like making sure that the container and the situation can respond and adapt to what is necessary. Sometimes everybody is together in one space and the feeling in the room is extremely relaxed and open. Sometimes it's like difficult and like a lot mm -hmm. of shit is coming up for a lot of people. And these things tend to happen collectively because as I said, the, the intelligence, yeah. the energetics of the collective ritual field really shapes its content and, and when that happens yeah you have to be prepared to to spend lots of time with people or to move situations around or to get really dynamic and how you're, you're trying to work the energy of the room to, mm -hmm. to help support the process and so so yeah it's it's a very sort of it's like it's an ongoing it's like one of the like this, one of these things that i that i do in my life where it's just like the learning and never ends and the and like the humility never ends and it's just It's so fascinating and exciting to me because it's just sort of a, a constant art of presence, I guess, and mm -hmm. knowing how to use your presence in a way that 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 supports and that is that is useful. Hmm. That's a good point. The presence of it, and then I can only imagine if it's a group of 16 people, and then like imagine uh, someone says something which triggers another person, and then this just goes like a ping pong thing, and then the whole room is in rage mode, and then a lot of shit just <laughs> came to the surface and then you, you're, yeah, you just, yeah. yeah, you look at your part and you think like, Oh shit, now we need to move some chairs. Like, is it all most this, of it? This is, is this has happened. This <laughs> has happened. Yeah. The, what's the kind of thing you're describing has definitely happened. You know, there's, there's always the shadow, you know, like it's not all love and light, like whatever, like whatever we're saying about it, there's this, there's another side there's the, the, the sort of inverse side that's yeah. not being said. And, And so like shadow work and difficult things, triggering rage, all these kind of things will come out in this process. And that's kind of like part of the, the drama, part of the theater of it, but it's like the, the, the ritualization of it, you know, and the, the, the container that holds that makes, if it's done well, mm -hmm. makes those explorations. And if it's within, if it's within what the facilitators in the community can hold, which is very yeah. important, then it makes those explorations and expressions safe, yeah. you know, but it's, it's very important that that, that when that happens, it's done in a context of trust and stability. Otherwise it can be, it can be destructive and dangerous, you know? So, yeah, so yeah that's always the learning edge. Uh -huh. uh, that makes it, for you and your partner, I guess, always super exciting because it's never the same, the same show. It could be a shit show or just a, you know, love, sun and rainbow. Um, yeah. But, well, 
you, you, you never want to deal with the shit show, but, <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes you do have to, that's just part of doing this work, you know, and, yeah. and dealing with your own too, you know? Yeah. Um, so. well, I just, I just think of how important now in this context, uh, the safety of the container and the report of you two towards the group and then having groups that continue that kind of work and that they have formed relationships and trust within the groups themselves is potentially so, so important here because even if it's every time you hold such a retreat, there's different groups coming to the table. They have not worked with themselves or the others beforehand. This in itself might even be critical when such a such an evaporation happens of, of let's say rage or anger or something and then just one group forms kind of a bond next to the other i mean it's to my knowledge it's pretty unlikely if they're on a high dose of mdma but i don't know what else happens if, if they combine different other psychedelics and then how important it is for them to have trust not just towards you and the medicine but towards themselves outside of their own individual groups yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this is where it becomes important when you're doing this kind of work to have a psychological background or knowledge within whatever cultural context you're working. So like if you're working in the West, like we are, you know, having having psychotherapeutic skill, having psychotherapeutic knowledge, knowing how to recognize different dynamics, different patterns, um, you know, and you will you'll always be you'll always be humbled and something will always catch you by surprise. You know, you can never get complacent. That's what I've learned. Um, whenever I had the feeling like, okay, I, now I think I know how to really how to do this. Something would happen that would totally knock me back on my feet and put me in my place. You know, so I've learned <laughs> be responsible and it's, it's not about you. You know, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So going for the first day and then people at the end of the first day, might be really tired. So a lot has happened, let's say on the Friday already. And then uh, they go to bed mm -hmm. in that beautiful arranged, you know, living room sleepover context, which I have a picture in my mind, which looks really cozy and everyone would just fall on different mattresses and stuff and then just share the soup and then have a loving <laughs> evening together there. And then lights out, people go to sleep. Next morning they wake up and you say, it just repeats the first day. So what happens until 4 p.m. when you start with the opening circle? Is there other modalities that you incorporate in that, like somatic, spiritual somatic experiences, like doing some yoga, breath work, or talk therapy? Or what happens in the morning? It depends. It depends largely on the, the context and where the event is taking place. If it's taking place, let's say, in a house in a city where people live, sometimes people will go home in the morning and come back mm -hmm. at 2 or 3 in the afternoon or whatever we're, we're starting if it's more in a retreat format, like out in the mountains, which is my favorite for me, like we don't really do a lot of structured things in the morning between when people wake up and when the process starts again sometime in the early afternoon, because I I've, I've found that the fact of just being together with people in a relaxed way, without anywhere to go, without having to do anything in this space that people have taken time for themselves away from their normal lives. So you just get up, cook breakfast, maybe go for a walk by yourself, maybe spend time in a deep conversation with somebody, maybe napping, you know, on the couch, but just being in a space with others in a relaxed way without agenda, I think it's really important, you know? So for me, it, it's like not about trying to, to schedule a program mm -hmm. all of the time, but really recognize that you're just trying to create a healing space in which you allow people to find the path or to find the, the place of comfort or the, to find the place of, of growth that they need. And so, so typically, yeah, the time between the morning and when the process begins again, you know, and when the circle begins again in the afternoon, we may have a more structured activity. We've done singing, or breathing or more sharing. It just depends on the mood. But before that, it's really open for people to just sort of be together and to rest. Um, yeah. If it's offline retreats, is it there's like a no technology zone, uh, like te technology free zone? I, I imagine my retreats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I haven't done that, but like during the COVID period with so much time on technology, like mm -hmm. all the time, like I, I'm definitely planning to introduce that in, in future retreats yeah. of a sort of no tech time 
around the beginning because I think this like tech and this tech detoxing is so necessary right now. Yeah, it also brings you more people. inwards, right? The tech just connects you with the outside world again. And to me, my experience of FOB was a lot that just having, you know, kind of this one rule, like there's no iPhone or whatever, no smartphone allowed for the next two and a half days. There's just a lot of people panic just through that. <laughs> it's just, oh boy, really? I know. Yeah. Well, and, and then you get into the whole dopamine addiction and all yeah. of the things that the screens are doing to your brain that are not really, not really aligned with what we're trying to accomplish with the medicine work. Yeah. So I found it really useful to combine it in that case, but that was just interesting to me to know. But then, okay, so that just got it. So there's not a strict agenda on the second morning. It depends on the circumstances and the group dynamics and everything. And then you just follow the first day, kind of similar structure in the afternoon with opening up, opening circle, and then using the different medicines on the different levels. And then seeing where mm -hmm. that evening will lead you guys to the shit show or the rain. Yeah. And... <laughs> I mean, typically, in, in, for example, in a two-night process, oftentimes I've found that the the first night tends to be, and nothing nothing I'm saying is a universally true. It's just a pattern I notice: one night, two night, three night. Oftentimes, in the two-night process, the first the first night can be the energy can be more jagged. People can be dealing with more sort of difficult things, or a lot of a lot of just stuck energy is getting released. Oftentimes the second night has is deeper and has a deeper sense of fluidity, a more coherent field of energy, uh, which allows for sort of a dropping into a deeper level of work. Is that the reason, or do you actually just for that reason, increase the substance dosages on the second day potentially to, to help them go deeper within? Potentially. I mean, it, I, I, again, it, it, it really varies based on the, the content of the group and the individual person. But I would say more often than that, yes, the second night will be will be deeper. And if the person is inclined to it, more more intense on the, the sort of classic psychedelic side versus the empathogen side. Um, but it, it depends. All right. And then uh, one, one other question that I had thinking about the one-on-one -on -one therapeutic work um, that I'm, I'm familiar with, where there's always a high focus on the intention that you bring into the work. Okay, what is the reason mm -hmm. for you for doing this for yourself? Mm -hmm. Is that also what you guys discuss with them on an individual basis? And is that in something like, let's say a group intention for the overall retreat weekend, just being open and for, to whatever, whatever uh, opens up? Or is, is there... A specific focus on intention work as well and that more communal aspect of the work yeah i mean i think i think intention is intentions are very important you know i, I like to invite people in, in the sharing that they do at the beginning of each medicine session to get, it's like an opportunity to give them an intention through a story that they tell but you know not everybody knows how to make a good intention or what their intention should be mm -hmm. and so i think it's it's like an important to, to, to understand the power of intention and to also hold it lightly um, so that people don't feel like, oh, you have to think of something and then they're not sure what they're trying to think of or the place that it should be coming from. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's, it can be a setting of intention at the beginning or it can be that throughout the process, people actually discover what their intention is. And by the end, they're able to say, you know, I really think, in retrospect, my intention coming here was, you know, X, Y, Z. And through the process, I've really connected to that intention in my life, you know? Um, so I think intentions can be set or they can be uncovered um, depending cool. on the person. Makes sense. Uh -huh. And then after the second evening is over, people go to bed, profound experiences happened, new connections have been formed. A lot of love has been shared and, and a lot of, fireworks has potentially happened you and your partner might be really tired at that moment already and it's like wow mm -hmm. what happened here and then you know okay mm -hmm. there's a third day coming and then you mentioned that the third day normally is you know it's it's focused on the story sharing and is that kind of the way that you frame the integ the start of the integration work which is so profound in that psychedelic therapeutic work to share like you said 
on the one hand, your individual experience that you had personally going through this, but then also how you felt in context to the overall group and then getting kind of a reflection from the other participants on your journey from different angles. And then this will consume the rest of the third third day or, or is that everything that's happening on the third day, basically? Yeah, third day, usually a shared breakfast that people make together. And then, yeah, that kind of sharing, as I said, you know, to me, framing the integration this is just where I'm at right now with it, by the way, it always evolves, but, but framing the integration in the context of story making and story sharing has been very helpful, um, you know, because, because we're always making, making stories and living stories from the direct felt experiences that we have in our lives. So the a medicine ceremony is different and a distinct experience sort of that you've taken for yourself apart from daily life but at the same time it's just part of life and so the processes and experiences and sense making that you practice there carries out into into the day-to-day -day. it's really the same you know it's really the same the way the way we have experiences the way we share those experiences the way we tell stories about them is all how we sort of integrate them into a pattern that makes sense for our lives and so mm -hmm. So for me, you know, it's like there's the process of talking in that specific moment together and creating that collective story together with many different facets and different opinions and different expressions. And then there's the practice of how that happens intentionally and unintentionally, consciously and unconsciously every day. And so that's that just becomes a launching point for the ongoing sort of weaving of, of meaning mm -hmm. you know the hope is that the, the relationships people form in these communities uh, sustain and that the so those connections become part of the integration as it as it sort of resonates over weeks and months and so forth yeah. so that is then also are you guys also working on the integration discussions afterwards with the people or is that basically it's their, their thing. So they will connect individually through the connections that have formed and then they'll continue to, between those, for, let's say four to five ceremonies or, or sessions throughout the week, they do the integration works themselves. Is your, your guys' job after the weekend is, is basically done? We're, we're always like super available and make time to continue to connect and help people process um, their experience after, because for the vast majority of the people whom we work with, we form relationships with them that last for quite some time. It's not just one weekend. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very, I would say maybe 5% of the people, five or 10 at the most percent of the people who have worked with ever come for just one weekend. And so, so we, we view those relationships as important and we, we maintain connection and openness and availability and, sometimes participants need a lot of support and, and follow up and sometimes they don't and we're sort of we're sort of flexible around how that's structured in a way that supports whatever the person is going through i see wow where can i sign up <laughs> and how can i convince <laughs> my parents to join as well um <laughs> wow uh, amazing is there one Kind of, if you think about all of the work that you've been doing over the last couple of years, is this what's your biggest lesson that you've taken away from all of this, personally for you? If there's one, it's hard to, to name probably, but maybe there's a couple. But maybe something comes to mind. I would say, you know, the main thing that I've come to really know in doing this work, both personally in my own process with my family um, as a student of this work as a practitioner of this work and all those things are happening at the same time the main thing I've come to really believe and trust is that um, like the the quality of the relational feelings that you carry within yourself how you relate to yourself how you relate to others whatever that feeling is will unfold and manifest in your life in tangible ways you know I never I never would have imagined 
eight or nine years ago that I would be doing this or supporting people in this way or that I would have made this such a central part of my life. I mean, it's kind of, it's like unimaginable, I think, <laughs> back then. But, but the feeling, the feelings around it and the sense of, of, of leaning into that feeling and trusting that, that the energy of that has guided me into creating the kind of life I have now, which is ongoing and continuing to evolve. And so trusting that, like not, not having to, to, to know the plan in advance, not having to have it all mapped out, but just being really clear about the space, the, feel, the felt space, the relational space from which you want to create. That's what this work has really taught me above all. And that, that, that creation is a collaboration and a dialogue within yourself, with the people around you, with your imagination, you know, with the plants and the animals, everything that's participating in your life is available for that process. So yeah, it's a different, it's a very different way of, of living, I think, than like the way many of us in this culture are taught, which is like you need a rational plan and you need to have step A, B, C, D all in advance, but, but it's very powerful and, and it, it teaches a lot about trust. Yes, so, so true. Um, trust in yourself and others, but like you mentioned, trust in the unknown as well, because life is uncertain, right? The only constant is that there is change and it will always endure and never stop. And then trusting in that unfolding of your own process that it will lead you as long as you follow that, what you call it, that inner feeling and the trust and that intuition or whatever you want to call it, that it will lead you to the place you're, you're meant to be uh, if you follow that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you still need skills. You still need tools. You still need a plan. You still need a rational process for, for making things happen in your life. But the place that you're creating it from is so important. Yeah. So the tool to make it happen and, you know, make the plants and everything sits in between the ears and the place where it should come from is further down in the chest. But it's, uh, it's a combination of both, both worlds, right? That yeah, I think to, to me also was a big learning that our mind is such a po powerful, the most powerful tool if used well. And with that comes the understanding of the stories that our mind produces all the time is coming from a place where it's just trying to make us survive. And a lot of those stories are just not, you know, true. So just to uncover what, what is right, what is not, and then live from that place of truth, which you have to define for yourself what that is, and then living out of that more and more. And through that, you know, learning along the way, but leaning into that trust. And like you mentioned before, living on that edge. Um, I think that's the, that's the key. That's the recipe for, for that. Um, for that game we call life but wow thank you so much for that insight Noah if, if yeah, you thank you Alex well <laughs> not for that but can you maybe a final word to people that are curious to learn more about this and then they have not their next door underground therapist at hand that they could just reach out to and call if there's something you could recommend people that want to learn more about this to start you know get their head into and like something that help you or others maybe is it some book recommendation some sites like something where you would say this is a good starting point and then if you go deeper into it the rest will unfold yeah i mean i think i think um depending on where you are and what you're doing i mean just continuing there's such a like continuing to listen to podcasts like this one, continuing to read, continuing to explore and to share with others whom you trust and whom you can share with about your, your interest in this kind of work. I think um, if you keep doing that, it, it will find you. I mean, uh, everybody I've talked to who's, who's come into this work has been something like that. So, um, so it's, it's out there, it is available and it's just kind of about, putting your opening yourself to the possibility of it being inquisitive sharing sharing with the people whom you're close to your interest in in pursuing this kind of a path and and sort of letting it find you i think at this point yeah hopefully hopefully it will become easier in, in the coming years as the stigma around it continues to dissolve Yes, let's hope so. Well said. Thank you so, so much, Noah, for this beautiful insight. Um, the first talk we had and now the second one, which gives people a more detailed insight on how such a ceremonial structure 
might look like. Beautiful. Yeah, and, great. Uh, great, Alex. Thank you. This was a pleasure to talk to you. Well, happy to have that, having had that chat and uh, looking forward to maybe whenever that pandemic decreases a little bit, see and meet you in person at some point. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love it. <laughs> uh, all righty. We'll, we'll make it happen. Well, okay. have a be beautiful rest of the day, Noah, and I'll, I'll chat to you soon. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks so much, Alex. Take Cheers. care.